Um, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's uh, board work session. Today is August 7th. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, next on our agenda is a uh, public comment. Is there anyone here with us that would like to comment um, to the board? Melinda, I don't see any hands raised, do you? I don't either, Madam Chair. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, next, we'll go on to the summary of the April 3rd, 2024 work, uh, board session. Is there any comments or corrections that we need to address? Okay, seeing no hands, uh, we'll move on to our economic development district designation. This will be presented by Dr. Flo Butano. Ma'am, you have the, the podium or the floor. And uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, well, delighted to be here. And, and I, I have to say that um, you know, I'm excited to make this presentation um, with you. And let's see if this works. So. You should be seeing um, uh, the uh, economic development district designation slide. Is that correct, Melinda? We can see it. Yes, that's correct. Terrific, okay. so. I got to tell you, I feel a lot like this this mountain climber here. Um, you know that that we did the SADS in in a six month period of time, and 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 so we've surmounted one peak, and then you get to the top and you realize that there's another one, um, and and that that second peak, if we decide to to climb that one, is really pursuing the the uh, designation as an economic development district. So um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. This, this, this afternoon. Um, well, EDD is short for the Economic Development District, and that's a designation that comes from the Economic Development Administration, which is a bureau of the U.S. Department of Commerce. I mean, the federal government loves its long acronyms here. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, what, what that means for us is, is that um, it could provide additional administrative and technical assistance and other resources for for our local communities. So that last that last bullet point there is 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 probably the most important for our consideration uh, in in pursuing the designation. Um, and and you know for instance that we we could leverage that EDA funding to help us um, contract for for grant writer services or or that sort of thing. So that's an important concept. And 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 and, and EDD is is all of those things. Um, and certainly you've seen that before. So how do we obtain this designation? And it, it, of course, is approved by the EDA. And those are the folks that approved our SEDS back in, in February. Um, and it has to meet the EDA regional distress criteria in, in, in at least one geographic area con contained within the designated region. And, you know, while our economy is is uh, you know humming along here. There still are regions of our, our uh, there, there are still areas of our region that don't quite meet that threshold of of uh, a robust economy, and so the EDA has let me know that we certainly would have no trouble meeting that that criteria for designation. And then the other thing is that we have to serve and represent our entire geographic region. So um, you know. Dr. Cog is, is used to hanging out with 49 municipalities and nine counties, and that would be who we represent in, in the economic development district as well. Um, you know, and everybody wants to know, so is this gonna duplicate something? Is this reinventing the wheel here? And, and no, of course it's not. And I think we made that point very clear in the development of the comprehensive economic development strategy for the region, that that the, the SADS and the activity of the EDD goes way, way upstream of, of what a traditional economic development council or corporation would do. And, and I think it's best illustrated by, by this slide here, which um, I absolutely adore. I know it's a busy slide, but you know, based on a foundation of leadership in the region, we then look at what the responsibilities of the economic development district for our region would be. And of course, you're looking at, at the workforce uh, development, affordability, we're looking at access to opportunity, we're looking at infrastructure, and we're looking at resilience. 
and 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 based on that foundation then is the success that rolls up to our economic development councils um whether that's at the local government level or if that's at the metro denver edc level and their focus is really largely on on um, recruitment expansion and retention and to some extent with entrepreneurial development so that's that's kind of the the separation of responsibilities and the differences between an EDD and an EDC. So looking at the cost benefit analysis, I always have to do one of those, right? And, and so what it means is that it would, if we're designated by the EDA, provide a additional funding to Dr. Cog for, for staff or capacity support. And, and that would allow us to provide some additional administration and technical support to our member jurisdictions, as, as well as to access some additional data sources and some technology resources. But it comes with a cost, everything, there's no free lunch these days. And, and uh, it does require a match and it says cash match here, but that's not quite right, it's, it, it can be in kind. And, and so certainly you look at, at, at the time that I've spent in working with uh, developing the SADs and, and, and looking at the investment that Dr. Cog is making available of my time, that certainly qualifies as, as an outstanding in-kind in, uh, in match. Um, the other downside is it's a relatively small amount of funding, if you can call right now $70,000 annually a small amount of funding. The anticipation is that, that funding to EDDs will increase in the next several years. They're, they're looking at a significant increase and bumping that up maybe as much as $120,000 to $140,000 uh, um, on an annual basis. It does require quarterly reports. You know, this is the federal government. It's a bureaucracy. They like to know what's going on. And then we, we are required to do an annual update to the SEDS, but we're required to do that anyway to keep our SEDS current in, in order for our municipalities and our counties to be able to access EDA funding. So, you know, that's kind of already covered. Well, part of the research that I've done to get us to this point to make this presentation to you this evening is reaching out to some of our peer organizations, both within the state of Colorado, as well as some of those that, that we talked to back when last year when we were talking about developing a SEDS. And, and so, um, you know, here are their, their comments of, about it. And I didn't have one single comment from any of our peers that said, bad idea, wouldn't do it again, don't do it. So, you know, you and, and uh, ECCOG is out on the Eastern Plains. They're based in, in, in Burlington. Um, and, and so they represent a very rural area, Northwest Council of Governments. Actually, kind of in in my home turf, it's up in in uh, Summit, Eagle, Pitkin, um, Grand, and Route counties. So the resort communities, but you can see you know how much of a, a premium they place on it. And then um, Andrew, the executive director at the Wasatch Front, um, also clearly has found some value in Salt Lake City. This is Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and I typically try and avoid a lot of text on slides. But these are actual quotes on 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 what they said, and and this this was um, William Murdoch, who's their executive director uh, in in Columbus, and and th these are observations that William offered when when I talked to him on the phone, and um, so big supporter of it, and and they're brand new at this. They just received their designation late last year, or. Doug, maybe it was earlier this year, but um, they just wrote their SEDs and have gone through the process, and they now are designated as an EDD, but clearly they're all in. And then I reached out to a veteran, uh, Mid-America Regional Council in Kansas City, and, and, and Marlene Nagel is their um, director for their EDD at uh, Mid-America, and, and they've been at it for quite some time, and, and so they've got a lot of experience under their belt, and so... These are some of the comments that that um, you, you know they they gave me in looking at that and in strengthening partnerships and you know working with new partners and 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 uh, expanding you know the 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 connection between affordable housing and transportation and workforce development and other initiatives 
um, which you're going to be hearing soon. Um, the next presentation has a workforce development aspect to it. And so there, there we go. We've got workforce development in our comprehensive economic development strategy. So there's some logic here to pursuing the designation. So the proverbial, of course, is in the details. And, and these are some of the details that, that we need to iron out. But, you know, what I'd, I'd, I'd like for everyone to, to think about is, is, is this something we want to do before we go too far down that road and expend a lot of energy um, on, on uh, pursuing the designation? Things like looking at creating an economic development district advisory council. Um, that would be well beyond um, the Dr. Cog board members. You know, we would be bringing in people from the financial sector, people from higher education, people from large employers, um, people from uh, community-based organizations, and and um, a wide variety of interests to sit as as kind of the leadership council for this, determining a meeting cadence, what works, looking at roles and responsibilities. Uh, understanding, of course, that with as with everything else we do at Dr. Cog, final decisions will always rest with the Dr. Cog board. So the EDAC would actually be advisory, that's why it's called an advisory council, in in modifying the SEDs, and, and on an annual basis, the board will still make those determinations, much like you do with Metrovision. And then there's always EDA odds and ends that we're going to have to have to probably deal with and, and, and look at. But those are basically some of the details that we'll need to pursue. So with that, I'm going to stop and and um, I will also stop sharing. And and ask if there are any questions. Any questions for Director Ferret? Hey, thank you. Flo, congratulations on your award. I saw that um, come through. So always proud of you. Um, you know, I just wanted to ask when you talked about in-kind donations or, you know, your time that you've already spent doing this, is it at the point in which we're, we're caught up or would we have to invest more? No, it would, you know, I uh, it would it would be my responsibility to to really manage things going forward, and 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 so that would be part of that in kind match. But the the seventy k would allow us to do really good things, you know, to to cover the the investment of maybe we want to take our econometric team and have them do a deep dive on something for us, and and so it would cover costs like that, or or we might want to contract for the services. Of, of of a grant writer and and so we could we could use um you know the 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 um funds for doing something like that so um you, you know it 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 gives us it gives us flexibility so there would not be another 70k that we have to come up with in the budget um you're you're looking at the match right now okay that's what i was wondering perfect um great presentation and i would be supportive of it Thank you. Anyone else? Flo, fantastic job. Thank you very much. Oh, Doug. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Sorry to just jump in here at the last second, but I also want to thank Flo for all the work that she's been doing on this <clears throat> and will in the future. Um, so, you know, so we are going to actively pursue this with, with, uh, with EDA. Um, please, if you, you know, you had an opportunity to speak to your economic development folks and their, you know, they're unaware of of this uh, this opportunity. Please share it with them. Have them reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to talk to them. Um, we I think we developed some pretty good relationships along the way, especially as we were developing the comprehensive economic development strategy. And um, I think you know folks that we weren't really familiar with a year ago, we are now, and I think they have some confidence in the work that we do. Most notably, the work that Flow does. So. Um, please, if they have any questions, just have them reach out to Flo or I, and we'll be sure to get them on, get them on the path. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Flo, very much, and congratulations once again from all of us. All right. Well, next is Dr. Cog Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Overview. How exciting is that today? Um, this is going to be pre presented by our own Program Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations, Mr. Robert Spots. Sir, you have the podium. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, good evening, I'm Robert Spott, um, the Mobility Analytics Program Manager here at Dr. Cog, and we are so excited to share this new grant awarded to us uh, with you all today. Um, so as you've heard, Dr. was awarded $199.7 million um, from the Environmental Protection Agency's Climate Pollution Reduction um, Program. I would love to thank Commissioner Baker for coming to the news uh, conference uh, last Monday or the, the, the couple Mondays ago. He did a great job uh, representing the program. So thank you very much for that. It was a very fun event um, and a lot of congratulations uh, were spread around by all. Uh, so a reminder that the Dr. Cog board did vote unanimously to pursue this grant during their January 17th meeting. We certainly took that to heart and poured everything we had into it along with um, our local stakeholders. Um, they were so instrumental in getting this amazing application done, which is what led to its success. Um, and the grant is going to fund a five year long building decarbonization program. Uh, a lot of the focus will be on low income and disadvantaged communities. We've pledged over 47% of those funds will be dedicated to those folks. It was um, a very competitive grant process. Only 25 projects out of 300 were selected. And again, I think that speaks to how amazing the application was. Um, and it only was that way because of the support of um, your staff uh, working together. So thank you all very much. And another exciting news, the Energy Office was also awarded their grant. They were one of those 25 as well. Um, part of their program is a local government climate action accelerator program. More details to come through that, but the intention is to distribute funds to local governments um, in the state of Colorado. So there will be more opportunities to look for there. So this program, the intention of it is really to be transformative. It's a five-year program, so it's not gonna last forever, but the intention is to um, really change the way our buildings are heated and cooled in this region. So uh, through our planning process, we found the buildings account for about 52% of end use greenhouse gas emissions in our region. So and they're extremely challenging to tackle. There's a lot of barriers that exist to um, improving that situation in our region. Um, there's limited knowledge about how far heat pumps have come and how they're um, often a more efficient and less expensive option to operate in your home. Um, contractors um, are not really willing to put those in at the moment because mostly because of a, that awareness issue and then the workforce as a result is not there to support installation so and there is you know especially if you're installing a new system where you may not currently have air conditioning or the right plumbing there's higher upfront costs to achieve that kind of like long long-term cost and emission savings so what this program intends to do is address each one of those barriers holistically and really transform the market in our region um, through our modeling, we estimate that the program will cut 150 about metric tons of carbon dioxide by 2050. That's a huge amount. It's like taking 35 million cars off the road for an entire year. We're going to train a bunch of folks in this region to do work and get into good jobs, about 4,800 workers trained, and engaging 1.6 million Coloradans and the benefits around the electrification and, and, and incentivizing them to participate in this program. So um, I'm gonna kind of go through some of these budget numbers as we get through the program initiatives individually, but the, the, that right column over there, we've touched on some of it, but we're planning on um, retrofitting about 1600 low income and disadvantaged communities, uh, residences, advising over 50,000 folks on um, what the opportunities there are for their homes, issuing about 40,000 rebates to individuals throughout our entire region. We're supporting all of our member governments with funding um, and training, as I said, about 5,000 folks. I will note at the bottom there, Denver, Boulder, and Boulder County have all pledged staff time to this program. We'll, we're willing to accept anybody else's if they want to get it, as well as leveraging some of the funds that they already have in their climate funds to um, be funneled through this program. So starting with the staff, so um, we are anticipating that about 16 new staff members will be hired at Dr. Cog. About five of those will be in the admins and finance uh, division, and the rest will um, be um, here at Dr. Cog to kind of support these individual initiatives and manage the consultants associated with them. In fact, 12 new contracts or so uh, acquired through RFPs. We're also talking about standing up a couple of, of advisory boards, as well as relying on the current network of um, folks that are working in this space cooperatively. The group called the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network. Um, it's going to operate in kind of a, a work group capacity to, first of all, to expand our capacity in this initial phase while we're standing up this program, as well as just provide their expertise throughout the duration of the program. 
So the first initiative I want to highlight is our engagement. We, have, we are taking this extremely seriously. It's a $4 million contract to engage with the public. Part of that is to distribute about $50,000 sub-awards to between 50 and 80 community-based organizations that really have roots in our community throughout this entire region. Um, and then another huge part is to provide incentives for folks that are willing to give their time to provide their important inputs in this program. So that includes incentives and stipends and childcare um, and other issues like that so that we can ensure we're getting the right representation from the right people and then supported in those efforts. Uh, the second contract or initiative I'll talk about is a $15 million contract uh, communication and marketing contract. So the first phase of that uh, program is intended to create public awareness about the benefits of building electrification and efficiencies. And then the second phase will be to motivate the, part, the public to participate in our programs. So we want this, um, we want this to be holistic and focus on um, the needs of our individual communities to make sure that our advertisements are placed in diverse locations, that they're um, in many languages and multicultural. Um, and we wanna have customizable content for you all to distribute to your communities. Um, and another part of this will be just research, advertising, website development, surveys, education, and evaluation. So it's, a big, it's, it's so funny talking about a $15 million contract. It's so huge on its own. It's just one small part of this program. Here's kind of the bread and butter. The first phase, one of the first phases is we, we would like to, we're going to provide about $40 million in free building decarbonization services for low income and, and disadvantaged communities. Um, so that includes finding the folks that are eligible and in need and taking them through the entire process from evaluation, planning, um, replacement and inspection, everything from front to back so that they have free new um, building decarbon decarbonized building that hopefully operates in a more efficient way. So that's about 1,600 um, units that we plan on um, providing that service to. A $7 million contract will be um, administered um, to, to perform a lot of that engagement and the, the work that has to be done as well as the audits and reporting. Um, before I get into this next slide, I just want to focus another another great part of that program that it just guarantees work for the contractors and the workforce that's developing so that they know that there are 1600 residences out there that are going to be retrofit or retrofit and electrified in the coming years and it incentivizes them to participate in this program. Um, this is a map of what EPA has identified as low income and disadvantaged communities in our region. I wanna stress that this is EPA identified and this is in the context of the Justice 40 initiative where 40% 40 of funds or more should be dedicated to these geographies. Um, so this is the, that one element of the program, the LIDAC um, decarbonization. Our current understanding is that though those funds need to be directed into these specific geographies. However, we don't wanna leave folks that are a block away from these geographies or on the other side of the region that are really in need to be left out. And we're gonna explore with EPA opportunities for how we can help folks out um, outside of these geographies as well. Uh, just to stress that, um, that that is the only program that is uh, kind of, as we understand it today, dedicated to those geographies. The rest of this program as I'm uh, describing it is um, intended to be used throughout the entire Dr. Cog region. So all nine counties plus the portion of Weld County that's in Dr. Cog. So a $17 million contract for energy advising services. So this is free data-driven client focused and vendor neutral advising. So someone would come into your home, evaluate your current system, give you a rough idea of the costs to, uh, to, to decarbonize your home, help you navigate the rebates, give you a list of contracts, potentially guide you through um, even the assessments and walk you through all the way to project completion. Um, rebates and incentives is about $42.6 million total, $40 million in direct rebates to our residents. So to be determined those um, incentive levels, and we are thinking about ways we can stack them with existing federal, state, and utility rebates to make that price of the installation really compelling for the customer. Um, we'd also have, want equitable distribution of these rebates based on income levels and the changing market over this five year period. And then a contract will help us administer these rebates, um, which includes the verification, processing, auditing. 
The Building Policy Collaborative is a $38.4 million initiative. So um, that $34.8 million in subawards is intended to go to you all, to our local government partners, essentially to expand capacity to allow this transition to happen. Whether that's somebody, a full-time staff member that works on building codes or permitting and processing application support systems administration, we have a long list of things. We are, we're we're going to evaluate how um, we distribute these funds, but there will be opportunity for all of you to um, participate in these funds and expand your capacity at the local government level. Um, the, the other part of this contract, $2.6 million, is to um, essentially expand the existing um, policy networks that are out there so that we're all um, kind of talking about best practices, um, evaluating opportunities to work together to advance building um, codes and policies, presenting to city councils, whatever it takes um, for the, the a policy collaborative to be successful. And then a million dollars to perform specialized work on behalf of peer to peer um, policy work groups. So, uh, you know, additional research as necessary. That alone is a million dollars. It's go crazy. Um, innovation pilot programs. This is really about um, demonstrating scalable solutions to key market barriers via pilot programs. Uh, so, the intention here is to award an average of $200,000 per sub award, so about five awards per year over the five years for folks that are willing or, or have excellent ideas about breaking down those barriers and, as well as informing decision making with public data. So uh, we'd love to target small businesses, especially ones that are women and minority, minority owned as we're giving out these awards. And one of those things where we'll develop, develop the criteria for giving out the funds in a way that again, accelerates this market transformation. Workforce is a huge issue here. There's not enough folks that are trained in any of these trades, whether that's the installation of heat pumps and um, or pipe fitting and ventilation or the ductwork and electrification, electricity, electricians, excuse me. Uh, so our, our what we want to do here is contract with regional existing regional workforce centers to offer training in um, this, this field. And that's including recruiting folks and placing them with the job seekers. Again, including stipends to reduce barriers to participation and employment. The goal here is to train a little over 700 individuals each year for this five-year program. The Contractor Navigation Hub is really about supporting businesses. So that's a devel business development support, um, especially small businesses that may need help and training in how to navigate these rebates, how to improve their business code compliance, permitting and business skill build building. So again, a focus, especially on minority and women owned businesses to prop up our region's great local businesses and make sure that they're um, reaping the benefits um, now of this program and successful moving into the future. So anticipating training over 200 individuals each year, including wraparound services and participant stipends. And I'm really excited about this one as well, $2.8 million in contracts, focusing on getting um, folks that may have trouble entering the workforce into these good jobs. So the first one is reentry renewable access program, and that's training folks that may be incarcerated today prior to the release, again, so that they have an opportunity to succeed upon exit from the justice system. Multicultural renewable access program that's um, focused on equity and multicultural communities. And then a youth renewables access program, which really focuses on at-risk youth and getting their hands on to, uh, again, a good job where they can succeed in the future. As I mentioned, the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network has existed for a, a couple of years now, and they were kind of the brainchild of this, this um, concept initially. They're still here to support us, um, but we're going to expand their capacity. And you don't have to be, I mean, you didn't really have to sign any paperwork to become a member of them anyway, but um, they're going to kind of form a, an initial foundation of support for this program and standing it up with their expertise. But we'll be looking for others to join in on that effort as well. Really closely associated, if, if you're not aware, uh, the Public Utility Commission recently required Excel Energy um, to spend $440 million on a lot of the same initiatives we're working on here. So that is fuel to the fire for us, for sure. There's going to be a lot of investment in this space, and that creates a lot of opportunity. But it will also require us to partner really closely with them as we move forward. 
And then, as I mentioned, Denver Boulder County and City of Boulder have pledged um, full-time employment employees to this program um, over the five-year program. So we'll be taking this um, to finance and budget to authorize us to negotiate the contract um, on August 18th. We will be working on contracting with the EPA, which I imagine will be no small feat given the breadth and um, extent of this program. We're already starting to work on job descriptions for some of the first hiring, um, the first tranche of hiring and thinking about the RFPs. You've, you've seen kind of the program overviews, but there is so much to think about in the weeds as we develop those programs and develop the RFPs. And then we're planning on coming back to you all in September um, with both updates and, a, and probably a more, not an action item, but a discussion about the role of our advisory boards we anticipate um, to, to set up this program. And with that, that's my presentation. And just, again, I wanna thank you all. It's been the honor of my career to be part of this. It's been such an exciting thing and it's such a big opportunity for our region. So thank you all. Thanks, Robert. Um, let's see, we have a couple hands up. Uh, Sarah, I'm gonna go with you first. And of course, uh, Director Martinez. All right. Um, well, Robert, uh, one, congratulations on this. This is just, it's so exciting and I'm sure it's rather intimidating as well <laughs> to get this all going. Um, I just had a couple of questions that came from some of the programs that you were, or some of the allocations that you were talking about. Um, one, with respect to how you'll be working with um, the disadvantaged communities with respect to getting uh, audits and an understanding and helping people understand how they can get their buildings um, into a more energy efficient situation. Um, how do, how might that overlap or uh, maybe tie into what Excel and I don't know if United Power has any kind of programs for um, energy audits and things like that, but I know you know, Excel has has somewhat of a um, an expanded program for um, this kind of work. So, have you thought at all about that? We have. Um, so, are you referring to Energy Outreach Colorado, probably specifically, or probably? I don't know the exact yeah. name. I just know that they do. Yeah. So they they're they're mostly funded through Excel funds, and um, we're certainly going to go through an RFP process. But we do anticipate that they would be highly competitive in terms of um, getting oh, okay. these funds. Um, so that we're not reinventing the wheel and that you know they're they're already working in this space in terms of weatherization potentially even expanding their capacity to the electrification component as well so certainly um have will work closely with that organization and um but it will be an rfp process at the end of the day great okay um that makes a lot of sense um the other question i had was for um when you're talking about the the policy um the money that would go towards developing policy and assistance like that, how might that um, overlap with, uh, uh, for example, there's, I feel like the whole Northwest Metro um, is, um, a lot of communities are working together in an energy cohort to um, work towards net zero building codes. And um, just kind of curious what the, you know, how you might take some of these sub-regional efforts and integrate those into how, how they might be able to tap into this programming as well. Yeah, absolutely. So part of what we want to discuss at the September board is kind of the official structure where we have right now, it, we're thinking about something pretty similar to our TAC and RTC. Um, so a technical group that, um, that kind of thinks about this as well as a an oversight board is what we're calling it. First of all, it gives us the project. We're giving out millions of dollars here. It gives the, the project transparency and, and opportunities for public comment. So we certainly anticipate those those boards or groups to have uh, local staff as well as elected officials on them to participate in the program fully. The other opportunity is through our kind of boots on the ground in the week to working groups that we anticipate supporting still. So we're kind of developing that structure today with the staff that that helped us um, develop this grant, as well as those that are already participating in the, the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network group. So there was no lack of opportunity to have your folks involved, I guess it is at the end of the day, and we will we'll take all hands on deck that we can get right now. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Justin. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, my first one is about the low income and disadvantaged communities uh, initiative. Um, will you be will will you be reaching out or partnering with the uh, various housing authorities out there that have you know concentration of of low income multifamily housing? And um, will it be a competitive process to for those um, housing authorities or any any provider of that kind of uh, housing product? Or I guess my question is how is that how are, how are the the providers or the you know the owners of those properties going to be able to get um, started on that project? Yeah, th thanks for your question. Um, I don't have the details right now. So it, part of that $7 million contract to distribute those funds will certainly be about how to identify um, and spread spread the money equitably to the right folks, right? So we're, that'll be part of the RFP process again. I don't mean to dodge your question. There's a lot of the details about how we're going to identify those folks that has to be worked out still. We certainly do want housing authorities and, um, and other organizations like that, including community-based organizations be part of the project development process. So we make sure we don't have any blind spots in our missing folks. That that advisory structure we're talking about with the various groups will be deeply involved in that decision-making process and to, to also have more oversight and make sure we're not missing anything and making the right decisions. Okay, great. So it sounds like a lot of that's to be determined. And then on the rebates and incentives program for the 42.6 million, um, you, it, there's a bullet point that says incentive levels will be based on community engagement and best practice research. Does that mean that the incentive, that the amount that is available to different communities will be dependent on how much they're engaged with the program? No, it, it's, no, it means that it'll it'll be based on. At the end of the day, it'll be really based on equity, as well as by by market conditions. We mean. What is the what is the current cost in the market of decarbonization? What is the landscape of other rebates that are available to folks, and how can we stack those together, essentially, so that we can maximize emission reductions, with, you know, by spending the least on rebates, while still still incentivizing people to participate in the program. Okay, so if I understand that right, it's more like incentives will be based off of what's could lead to the most efficient outcome. Yeah. Okay. And then my last question is about the uh, building policy collaborative, the 34, 34 point eight million in sub awards to member governments. Um. So that sounds like those those are grants that that we could apply for through like sub sub grants. I don't know what you call them, but how would that work? How can each of our jurisdictions, um, you know, how would we go about in getting those sub awards? Another great question. So again, not dodging uh, your question, but the details have yet to be worked out. Okay. The intention is to expand staff capacity at the local government level. Um, to be frank, the math is basically $600,000 per community for all 58 communities in our region. I'm not sure it will let exactly work out like that, but that's roughly one staff person over the five year um, period of the, this program exists. So it's not an insignificant amount of funds, but we do again, want to be conscious about maximizing the opportunity with those funds, maximizing the efficiency if there's partnerships um, and any way we can to most efficiently spend those funds. And again, all of these decisions will be going through these kind of oversight groups that we're going to be establishing here. So lots of opportunity to comment and have that fund, those monies are distributed. Okay, yeah, and just to follow up. So in Thornton, we are considering doing some, you know, we, we got the ball rolling on on doing some a comprehensive environmental policy. And in this building, you know, efficiency is going to be a big part of that. So, you know, we we would like to communicate with you guys on this in terms of, you know, how to best position ourselves so that our work aligns with the goals in it outcomes desired for this grant uh, because that is something that you know I believe this initiative in Thornton is is you know a big part of it is is aligned with this so I just want to say you know if, if we could 
uh, you know, if you could let us know when a good time to reach out and, uh, and you know, kind of get your input on on this as we craft our environmental policy going forward, that would be really, really beneficial to us and probably any other member here who is uh, also doing that same kind of work. Thanks, Director Martinez. That's that's the market transformation we're looking for, and we'd, we'd love to reach out as well to you in the working groups, or please feel free to reach out to me or um, Doug any time. Okay, yeah, I will I will definitely uh, have our team reach out to you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Justin. Justin. Yes, thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, under the innovation pilot programs, just wondering the process for uh, determining women and minority owned businesses, um, because sometimes that's a barrier to get certified in that. So wanted to understand a little bit about that process. You're going to hear the same answer from me over and over again, but we, you know, <laughs> to be determined, to, to be honest, that, that, that the concept of that program um, is um, based on a program in California called Clean, Clean Tech California, I believe. Um, so a, a consultant actually runs that program, I believe, and helps identify and select those programs. That's not to say that we're going to set it up in that way or use a consultant, but we are. Uh, Obviously, that will be a really important part of that program. It's, I'm sure what made part of what the grant of compelling to EPA was focusing on um, those aspects, including women and minority-owned businesses. So it will be important to determine the best way to do it, and you will have opportunity and oversight over that, um, how that program is designed and developed. Great. And then for the green workforce, you have a very specific number here. And I'm wondering how you arrived at that because you it'd be hard to know who responds to that RFP. I worked at a youth corps for many years. They do green career uh, development, but to you, it'd be hard to know how much cost per head that is. So I wanted to understand how you got to the number of 700 entering the workforce. So I, I I'll, I'll be honest, I probably don't have the technical expertise. I could find out exactly from the folks that put together that, that portion. Um, but it is based on, I believe, the current work that most likely that Denver and Boulder are doing and their experiences in working with these workforce centers and given given the return on their investment. So that it, was, it wasn't, I don't want to say it was done on the back of an envelope, but it's more sophisticated than that. But we do understand that these are all estimates and there, there will be, for all these numbers that pre were presented, it's not going to shake out exactly like that, but they were our best estimates to put into the grant. But like nonprofits, so you mentioned EOC, like a nonprofit working in workforce development with young people focused on green jobs could apply to the RFP. It doesn't yes. have to be limited to some of these workforce centers. Great. And then my last question, apologies, is, 3 million for 5.1 FTEs. Did I miss, like, is this over multiple years? I'm sorry if that estimate was for that, but that seems like a lot <laughs> for the in-kind donation. So you had a number of around 3 million oh. and 5.1 FTEs. That does sound like a lot. That was Denver and Boulder's estimate um, of what the value of their FTEs was as they were coming. Oh, I want to work in Denver and Boulder. Right. Then. Okay, so, <laughs> so. You know, just something to think about. Okay, that's and it for me. So just to clarify, there, there's no required match for this program. So it, it was really just kind of demonstrating icing on the cake for EPA's benefit. Um, but there, we're not we're not required to report and demonstrate that as part of our reporting. It was really just, um, again, just demonstrating the, the extra, you know, investment that will be put into this program. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Director Levy, and then Holton, and then Kern. Claire? Oh, thank, thank you. Um, and I appreciate everybody's help in um, my react button, which sort of disappeared, but now it's back. A um, couple of questions. I may, uh, this, Director Normello may have may have gotten at this a little bit on uh, in the, the discussion about Excel and you know how they're going to be um, scaling up their their capacity to provide all this electrification um, as this is coming online. You know, we're we're already hearing about capacity issues and overloading in the grid, and and um, you know it's been a little bit bumpy here in Boulder County as we've tried to have the Marshall Fire rebuild. You know, a thousand homes over a thousand homes. 
um, be primarily electric, and um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how what the involvement of Xcel Energy and the PUC has been on that specific issue. Thanks, Director Levy. Um, we are having initial conversations with them. Um, we, we understand fully how important of a partner they will be, but we haven't really gotten off the ground quite yet to have detailed conversations. You know, I, I, the one thing I will mention is that the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network is supported by an Excel contract. So Excel is paying for a contract uh, through, Brendel Group is the one that won the contract. And they are the ones kind of facilitating this regional work. So they they don't go much beyond that, but the facil facilitation is very important. And Excel staff is plugged into that process um, to understand the local government's needs. They're, they're suggesting and hoping that um, they can continue that program, the Partners in Energy program, first of all, to help us stand up the program, which is extremely valuable in this time before we're staffed up. And eventually we're talking about evolving that program so that it really works as a conduit between our program and local government staff and um, and Excel so that there's kind of consistent communication and, and um, facing those obstacles. We also believe that Excel and other utilities should be represented on our advisory board and oversight council. Um, you know, we haven't gotten into the details yet, but we really hope for membership from director level folks at Excel so that they are hearing the issues that we're facing and that we can work together to break down those barriers together. So initial stage of the conversation, but we fully recognize that that's probably the most important and challenging partnership that we will have for this program. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, we, we really felt like guinea pigs. Um, you know, they didn't have the people to even process all the, the permits for, um, you know, to hook up the solar and turn that on. Um, it was it was not uh, smooth. Um, also, just wondering, and first of all, you know, this is just an amazing um, opportunity here, and and I love how you've divided this up. Um, you know, just kind of into the chunks and the aspects of it. Um, um, I'm just thinking about phasing and the in real incredible workforce shortages that we have right now already with people who actually understand like what is the what are the BTUs that are needed um, out of a you know a, a particular m model of heat pump and which is the right one um, and you know that there's it's going to take a while to get people into the pipeline um, and have them really be able to do this work and then actually put that money into the electrification uh, decarbonization. So have you thought about that phasing um, um, of, of these projects and how how that work would flow? Yeah, great question again, Director Levy. Yes, we certainly have the, the work plan included kind of a, a schedule, if you will, as well as expenditures by year. And to that end, yes, the focus on early on will be about developing that workforce and business uh, and innovation, as well as the initial phase of marketing, um, mostly the public awareness component of this to, to, to make folks aware in our region about the benefits of building electrification. So we're not planning on launching the rebate program until the middle to late of next year, after we've kind of gotten through that first phase of training folks and working with businesses. And we don't anticipate the uptake to be as quick in the that first year of the program as later on. So we're, we're anticipating that we'll be ramping up again as that workforce um, is arriving here, contractors are more familiar and the public is more aware. So that's when that second phase of the marketing comes in to further um, encourage the public to participate in our programs. And I guess my last question is um, you know, five years, um, you know, there's urgency, right, to get this done and get this money out. Um, I I worry about our ability to to get it all done in five years. Is is that um, is there flexibility on that? Do you think from the EPA? And you know, and the reason I worry about it is shortage of contractors, supply chain, just the you know sheer scale of what we're trying to do here. Um, so we are we have our kickoff meeting with EPA regarding contracting next week. That's probably one of the top things on our list to ask them is what, how much flexibility we have um, with this program designed as is, including the duration of the program. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Director Holden. Great, thank you. Um, just huge congratulations, Dr. Cog. People may not be aware, but Colorado is the only state that got awarded both uh, at the Dr. Cog level and the state level. So Colorado just nationally is really uh, putting forward incredible proposals for this competitive funding um, through the Inflation Reduction Act and the EPA. So just congratulations, this is really exciting. Uh, and the magnitude of it is like, it's. Honestly, it's hard to even get your head around it on your slides, Robert, because the dollars are just so big and the magnitude is big. I don't need to tell you that, but just like seeing it is just is really overwhelming. Um, the thing that really strikes me, having sort of been tracking these dollars that are coming through federal programs, we have, you know, somewhat related dollars coming through Colorado Energy Office, through other programs. And I'm just curious if you could maybe speak to how Dr. Cog is working with um, other, sorry, my dog's about to bark, bark. Um, how Dr. Cog is coordinating with energy office around just like the clarity of communication. Like it's exciting that the funding's coming, but like when I consider myself just an everyday consumer who's hoping personally to take advantage of some of these opportunities, it's really overwhelming. So just how is Dr. Cog planning on both coordinating and then like, you know, creating some contours and communications around like, what is this program um, in relationship to other programs and funding that's coming into the state that um, Dr. Cog constituencies may be uh, benefiting from as well. Thanks Director Halton and, and thank you for your support um, during this whole program. We really appreciate it. Um, I, I, so. Energy Office is obviously another really key partner for us. They were um, working with us through the grant application development the entire time. Um, you know, we certainly wanted to make sure our programs didn't overlap and we obviously did a good enough job that EPA approved both of them. So we're very proud about that. Uh, we certainly want the Energy Office on our advisory boards and committees as well as in our working groups. So we want Energy Office involved throughout this entire program. The um, Part of the program is is about developing a brand and kind of removing this kind of big today's patchwork of incentives and rebates. And we can't fully solve all those program that those problems. Excuse me. There's still going to be a patchwork of utilities and their incentives. But but part, the job of the energy advisors that will come to your home is hopefully to clarify that entire landscape, right? So they which rebates can you stack upon each other and how much should this thing cost so that you can really get a full picture of the upfront costs as well as the potential cost saving over the long term so you can make an informed decision and then obviously identifying qualified contractors uh, to install these things so the program is meant to holistically assist clients in our region to make good decisions about decarbonizing their home Great. That's really helpful. And just as a local elected, I'm excited to have those communication tools for my constituents because I know that there's a lot of excitement, but confusion. So really excited to see that coming forward and, and uh, 2025 is going to be busy. So, but again, <laughs> congratulations. Thanks, Rachel. Director Curran. Hi, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, congratulations again. You guys did an amazing job writing up this grant, I think, to get this kind of money. Kudos and the conversations months ago. Um, and I always like speaking after Director Levy because she kind of alleviates some. So I'm just going to add to her emphasis of working with Excel Energy, being in Louisville um, and part of the Marshall Fire Survivor community. I will tell you, we still today struggle with Excel Energy, with the electrification, with solar going onto people's homes. And we are part of the new wildfire um, preemptive uh, power outages, power shutdowns from the grid, uh, which is helpful. We, we reducing far wildfires, but what a lot of homeowners have learned is that four days without power when it is cold is really a struggle and their solar doesn't work when they're tied into Excel. And Excel has been a really bad partner in helping people to utilize the solar without having to feed into the grid and going back to their own homes. 
I guess my point is just if we can expand the conversations with Excel, uh, they make a lot of promises, which is great. They just haven't recently fulfilled on very many of them. Um, and being elected and living in it every day, uh, it's the struggles are, are very, very real when we're trying to encourage people to electrify even more. It's it's difficult, um, especially when this past winter, the only way people were able to heat their houses for four days was with a gas, a propane fireplace in Louisville. So, um, but then I, I was curious to know if there is any of this that is um, going to help with the cost of solar, since we're asking people to be more energy efficient and do more electrification since Excel Energy is not doing um, as much renewable um, energy as we would like them to, although they're in the moving in the right direction. If there are residents that would like to be able to provide that for themselves, if we're planning on this program helping to fulfill that. Thanks, Director Kern, and point well taken about Excel. Uh, there, there's no um, component for solar incentives in this program. That said, it could be a component of the energy advising service where they're also evaluating at the, those rebates that are available full for solar and kind of taking that into account as they're estimating future savings um, for the consumer with the heat pump installation as well. So no direct incentives for solar, but we, we do wanna be mindful about that um, through the energy advising service. Okay. Um Two other questions, I guess I have three, but two other big questions. Um, I know that the rebates are probably a good year out as you were mentioning that programs, there's a lot of time to tweak. If we could look at maybe giving thought instead of doing rebates to the individual, when we're talking middle and lower income families, a lot of them don't have access to the resources to prepay for a 30 to $40,000 system. And if the rebates can go directly to a vendor, kind of like the way that we do our $500 e-bike, it goes to the vendor of the e-bikes instead of the person having to put the money out. It helps people to try to do something. If we're giving like 10,000 in rebates, they realize they only need to have $20,000 instead of 30 for um, updating their HVAC system. I think that would be better than people needing to spend their cash and wait many, many months to get a rebate. Thanks, Director Kern. Uh, that is certainly our intention. We have to see the requirements of EPA, um, and we're going to go through an RFP process to see how, but midstream rebates is certainly our, our desired outcome. Okay. Oh, that, that would be great, because I know that's been um, one of the struggles up here with Excel Energy rebates and things, is people have to make these huge investments, yeah. and then they're waiting many months, up to a year or more, to get um, the rebates after they've paid on it, and it, the interest rates of several percent that's that's a lot of money um out of pocket that's unnecessary and since we're going to be doing such a cool program like this um and we talk about how expensive the um air source heat pumps are the cold climate air source heat pumps or even ground source which um i would really love to encourage the program to incentivize that for, for new construction is are we working to try and find a way to bring the cost of that down if there's going to be so many more of these products being brought into the state and specifically our region, perhaps we can collectively work at bringing the price of that down. So, you know, we maybe five years ago, you had a couple hundred of these a year going in. And if we're talking about doing a couple thousand, that seems like a real major boost to the industry as well as the suppliers of these heat pumps that we could do some collective bargaining and try and reduce the cost significantly? Um, amazing question, Director Kern. Um, I'll start by saying, it's kind of tied to your last um, question as well, but the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is a $2 billion award um, to a, a coalition of folks to help with financing um, decarbonization projects, is getting kicked off the ground. And they're talking about having Colorado be their pilot program. So there's no promises or anything yet, but it is an opportunity for really low interest financing, whether that's on the business end or the consumer end, to be um, addressed in this, in this region, which is a really exciting um, opportunity. And $2 billion is no, that's national, but no small amount of funds. Secondly, yes, um, there's been a lot of discussion initially. Again, nothing's uh, concrete yet and appreciate the advice about doing something like a group buy um, or, or potentially even 
purchasing a lot of the the equipment appliances up front and even storing them somewhere um, so they're kind of ready to go out the door when we want them not waiting on manufacturers to deliver them individually to homes so we will be evaluating any and all options for cost savings as well as avoiding global supply and demand issues thank you uh it, it's actually really encouraging that you guys are so like ahead of everything i mean i ask a question you're like yes we're working on that i just wanted you to know that's impressive thank you very much thank you to you uh director condo yes um you know as i was thinking about the last series of questions uh one thing that came to mind is you may have people that are remote uh say in the mountains or out in the plains and may, they may want to contemplate doing an off-grid solar system uh so i often wonder if that's also something that we ought to consider or think about um that there are maybe micro microelectric grids and things of that nature that could very well be one way to manifest this and uh, whether your team is, is really kind of thinking about that possibility. Thanks for the question, Director Kondo. We're, we're really focused on buildings and I think we've got our hands full with buildings before um, biting, taking on another bite of from something like that. I, I, I'd encourage, um, you know, that doesn't preclude us from supporting the building side of uh, building we may have a microgrid or is, is off the grid. So um, we would support it in that way, but not the microgrid itself. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for this discussion, everyone. This is very, very, very um, helpful for Dr. Clark's staff. Uh, Doug. Madam uh, Chair, thank you so much. And I echo that comment. I mean, truly, this 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 round of questions and discussion has been great for us. I'm sure Robert has taken is trying to absorb all this in. And um, listen, we're we're energized by this challenge, right? It's it's uh, it's going to be a lot of work, obviously, as we all know. Um, and we really want to be deliberate over the next few months and how we lay this out and develop a framework, most notably for any personnel decisions, you know, internal personnel decisions as well as kind of a committee structure, you know, we're Dr. Cog, so, you know, there's gonna be a committee, right? Um, and we're kind of developing out some, a process in which, quite frankly, it allows you all, the board, the Dr. Cog board to be best informed about these decisions. So we wanna make sure that we, we set this up at decision points where you feel comfortable you're getting that information. So I would suggest right now that it will be set up similar to kind of our committee structure on the transportation side with an RTC and a technical advisory committee meeting uh, group, that type of thing, as well as some work groups associated with. Um, but yeah, I mean, we listen, ultimately we want this program that we want a program that you all are gonna be proud of. And, and listen, we might, yeah, as we get down the road, um, as you know, there's a lot of unknowns with this now that, you know, we're hoping we have the flexibility that there could be an element of this program that really catches on, right? And we can really move and we might be able to move some additional funding under that area versus some other, right? Um, so I think a lot is yet to be determined, but we're excited. I, <clears throat> I actually was the first one to see Robert after he got the news and um, the look on his face, I don't know if it was horror or actual excitement, I would suggest it's probably a combination of the both. But, uh, but I, you know, he he did he's done so much work on this as well as some, a couple other staff members, Maddie and Max. Um, so appreciative of the work that he's done. But he would be the first one to say, as he did earlier, that this was impossible uh, uh, without the support of your staffs as well as other stakeholders in our community. And we're going to rely on them very heavily going forward to make sure that this program is successful. So thank you all so very much and uh, stay tuned. You'll be hearing a lot more about this um, in the near future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm gonna turn the, the floor right back to, over to Doug for some important updates before we adjourn for this evening. So thank you very much, Doug. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you so much. I just had a couple things for you all real quick. So first on the award celebration, it wouldn't be a meeting without me bringing this up. Um, August 28th, I hope uh, hope you you got your tickets. If you haven't, there's still time. I believe the deadline is August 14th, um, but you know that's it's kind of a soft. It's it, well, yeah, it's a soft deadline. Wink, wink. I mean, if you if if you don't get in by that deadline, let me know, and I'm sure we can find you a seat. 
but don't forget board members it's free for for you that evening um if you want to bring a guest it's 50 dollars additional so but we'd love to have you we still got room for table sponsorships if you're interested in that we've got quite a few communities already signed up so we thank you so very very much for all that um on the housing assessment um a couple things on this so uh, Denver 7 did a story. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to, to see it or not. And I'm, as I'm talking to you, I am going to try to drop it in chat. I hope that works. Yeah, I, I just dropped a story in the chat um, for you all. Uh, Sheila Lynch was uh, was interviewed and it was just kind of a general overview of the regional assessment. And um, And I thought she did a wonderful job. Also, at the last board meeting, you remember when we had a, um, a presentation from our consultants and, and Sheila about the regional housing needs assessment, um, there was discussion about um, a dashboard, a data dashboard that was developed as part of that contract. Well, um, earlier last week, um, Sheila uh, and staff met, they had a workshop basically a virtual workshop with uh, with your member staffs. And we had, I don't know, 80, 90 folks sign up for that. And we're online um, to just learn a little bit more about what the dashboard is, what its capabilities are and what it's not, right? Um, so, and I think that went over really well. Staff is now holding some office hours for specific questions um, that member communities might have about the dashboard to kind of help them through that process. But it's available for you all now uh, as well. So um, um, the the Dr. Cog newsletter that was that was rolled out today, um, and I know you read that every month. So if you go down about six stories, there's one there about about um, about the housing needs assessment, and there's a hyperlink within that article that they'll send you a link directly to the dashboard. Um, so have a look. I mean, if you can find it, that's great. We'll send we'll send the link out to you all here in short order, um, and just just so you can play around with it a little bit. It's pretty powerful. You get the you know you can query your your local community and and just uh, see some of the data associated with housing needs and all that kind of good stuff. And last but not least, um, this this is not etched in stone, but I just wanted to uh, get it on your radar. It's possible we might be canceling the uh, August twenty first board meeting. Um, so just kind of stay tuned on that. Keep it on your calendars for now, but I think that it's, it's a, it's a real possibility. Um, I will tell you though, that even if we do cancel the business meeting, we will have the, uh, both performance and engagement committee and finance and budget committees. Those will be both virtual if we, if we cancel the, the regular board meeting. So just kind of stay tuned. We'll be making that determination here be, uh, no later than Monday. That's it for me, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, everyone, for having um, some time to spend together with us today. Thank you for the staff of Dr. Cog for putting this the agenda and all the items together for us. Thank you, directors, for your time tonight. And we are now adjourned at 5.09, and we will all see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.